Okay, I'm actually staying in the States because I actually want to welcome the next speaker. I'm very happy to introduce uh, George Matthew. So George Matthew is the CEO of uh, Kespri. Uh, you know, before of that, I'm like uh, COO and president at Alteryx. So uh, I'm very happy to welcome him, not only because he's a great presenter, but also because he just joined, you know, like uh, the Carto board, you know, like as of uh, two months ago. So George, thank you very much for joining Carto. Uh, thanks, and thank you for being here. Absolutely, thank you. So I was actually asked that everyone who's in the back, there's some plenty of seats up here if you want to just come up and sit down. We've got, we've got some talking to do here. All right, so today what I wanted to do is spend a little bit of time going through what we believe is some of the fundamental shifts that are occurring in technology, specifically when it comes to artificial intelligence and how it gets applied into a variety of use cases. Specifically in my world, I've been focused on what's known as industrial work. So I'm gonna talk a lot more about machine learning, applied artificial intelligence, and how we can actually change the future of work for better. If we start off this conversation, one of the first things that we start to see is this applied set of use cases from an artificial intelligence and machine learning standpoint that's quite unique. Excuse me? Oh, uh, let me grab the dongle. Hold on, I'll be right back. <laughs> I, I know where it is. I don't, I don't think you're going to find it. All right, that'll prepare us for the demos later on. Perfect. Okay, so if we look at this, this world that's emerging in front of us, there's interactions that can be had today that we've never seen before. Does anyone happen to know exactly where this is? Throw it out. What's that? Uh, not quite. What's that? Uh, where? Chinatown. 79 Christie in Chinatown, for anyone who's actually been in New York. It's actually Wafang number one, and Wafang number one is probably the best roast pork that one dollar sign can buy in Chinatown. It's great, check it out. Let's actually play an interaction that's occurred calling a Chinese restaurant for a reservation. Go ahead and play the sound. See how may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people? When? Um, Today? Tonight? Next Wednesday? At 6 p.m. Oh, actually we leave here for like opera, like uh, five people. For few, four people you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For, when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the 7th. Oh, no, it's not too busy. You, you, you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. Anything unique or special about that interaction that you heard? That's right. On one end of that conversation, as you've probably heard with the joke in the cold open, is that one end of the conversation was actually driven by AI. There's only one human in that interaction. In this particular case, at Google I.O. about two and a half weeks ago, they introduced the context of Google Duplex. The capability of Google Duplex enables a machine learning artificial intelligence enhanced bot to be able to have a conversation with a human that the human can actually never understand that's a bot on the other side. And to the point that we now see that interaction is such that now there's an ethical and moral dilemma that we have to talk about, which is, does the human have to know that there is a bot on the other side? Does the bot have to identify him or herself as being a machine versus a human? Let's actually listen to another interaction, this time at a hair salon. Happens to be Hair Collective in San Francisco, which is where I'm from. 
Go ahead and play the sound. How can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. What's that? Totally freaky, right? When you think about how these interactions are, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to distinguish in this case who was the human and who was the bot. In this case, the bot was calling in. It was a human that was interacting. But you notice that interaction where they were looking for an appointment at 12 o'clock that wasn't available shifted back to a conversation between 10 and 12, what services were available, and each one of those interactions, the bot, machine assisted, machine learning assisted, was able to interact properly with the human without being able to distinguish any sort of uncanny AI experience in that, in that overall interaction. So we're moving to this moment where the, the alignment, the distinguishment, the separation between man and machine is actually quite blurred. Anyone know about Go? Has anyone played Go? Has anyone hear of Go before? Okay, so what, what, what's unique about Go versus chess for anyone who's at, played both games? Go ahead and throw it out. Combinations, right? Because you can't go figure out computationally all the potential moves that are available inside of Go that you could with chess, right? At this point, from a computational perspective, you have the ability to go figure out every single potential interaction in a chess game where there is no human in the world that can beat a computer at chess. Not the same for Go, because you have these combinations, you have these nuances, you have semantics in the game where you cannot have a series of computational algorithms conceive of all the potential moves that are possible. So it wasn't perceived that it would be possible for a computer to be able to beat a human at Go for at least another decade because the computational powers were effectively not in place to be able to do all the calculations that were necessary. So what we're seeing today is the application of cognitive science and deep learning techniques where we're now able to simulate human thinking with a machine. And in this case, in 2016, this was applied to AlphaGo, which was a project to see if we can actually beat a human at Go. So the first set of matches were against a guy named Lee Sedell. Lee Sedell was the number three Go champion in the world. So this guy's pretty good at what he does. In his first game, he was actually not that serious about playing the computer because like, my God, there's just no way that a computer can take on my prodigious skills at Go. Turns out, he lost the first game. It's a game, uh, it's a match of five. So after regrouping, you go to match two, and on the second match, on the 37th move, AlphaGo made a move that was so unique that Lee Sedell had to actually walk off stage to regroup because he didn't understand what was going on. One of the commentators actually says it was a very strange move. The commentator himself was a ninth level Go player, which is uh, the highest rank there is for, for Go, a ninth Don Go player. Everyone in the room thought it was a mistake. Lee Sedell, leaving the room, took 15 minutes to formulate a response. Fan Gu, who's a three-time European Go champion, saw the beauty of this rather unusual move. Lee himself was in shock. I'm absolutely speechless. 
because they never perceived that there was a way to play this particular interaction that, frankly, no human had seen in the 5,000-year history of Go. And that's absolutely incredible that you're able to now open up these opportunities where the machine can think in ways that a human couldn't. Lee Sedell went on to lose not only game two and game three, but then finally made a comeback in game four. Yay, humans. Yay. And then lost game five. We're at an incredible juncture in humanity where the man-machine debate is playing out right in front of our eyes. So what's going on? What's the underpinnings of everything that we're seeing here as far as the machine learning artificial intelligence capabilities that, that are emerging? The context is that we've historically believed that narrow AI, the ability for things to be traditionally automated using machines, and effectively create a better efficiency, it was always going to get better. Like, that's been the way that we've seen artificial intelligence and machine learning evolve. But now we're at this sort of cusp where we're seeing little moments where general AI, the ability for very complex tasks, things that were effectively in the realm of human beings being done in a very organized way by machines, which wasn't potentially even conceived before. One element of this whole school of work is known as deep learning. So what is deep learning? In the context of deep learning, what you're seeing is a cascade of multi-layered interactions, nonlinear processes, basically a series of what's known as gradient descents. Stochastic gradient descents are being used for feature extraction and transformation. You're taking a successive layer of outputs of a previous layer of input and then either using a supervised model like we're classifying something and supervising how that deep learning interaction is occurring, or an unsupervised model where there is a pattern interaction that we're matching, the machine is actually matching the necessary pattern interactions, and then the entire layer of interaction is abstracted in a way where it forms a series of hierarchies. So in this example, we take a series of faces, we're able to now contrast the difference between the faces, we're able to extract all of the features within the faces that we're looking at, and then we're effectively going down and recognizing which faces are similar to each other. It turns out that this is exactly how humans think. So for some of you who are dog lovers, you might recognize that as a, a Boston Terrier. In this case, it's a purple Boston Terrier, so it's probably the first time anyone's seen a purple Boston Terrier before. But anyone who knows dogs immediately understands that's a Boston Terrier. The way we know that is that there is an information bottleneck that goes through our brains. This ability for us to unpack what a Boston Terrier is, in this case a purple Boston Terrier, is the use of these information bottlenecks to be able to process how humans learn. And so those same techniques that humans have used for millions of years, we're now using that same ability to evolve the way that machines are now thinking. And this is incredible, because if you think about it, the race for this capability is only accelerating around the world. So China this year is investing somewhere in the neighborhood of, a, of half a billion dollars just in AI development. By 2030, there's seven billion dollars of AI development that's planned to come right out of China. As many of you know, the US is leading all the chip design, GPU-based computing, whether that be on-premise or in the cloud. The UK is now funding over 1,000 researchers that are doing work in applied AI, particularly in terms of getting their PhDs. Germany actually just started a hub in Berlin just for startups that are focused on artificial intelligence. And this is my favorite. Vladimir Putin outright said that the country that leads AI will rule the world. Now, I don't know about you, but I take that dude very seriously these days, particularly after this election cycle. I see this as a really impressive moment in human history. When we look at the ways that work changes for us, it's an opportunity to be able to take 
the interaction of what the machine is providing, the capability of the human, and start to bridge that in a meaningful way. So historically, when anyone who's a data scientist in this room, anyone who's worked in analytical platforms like myself for many years, we've been largely working with numbers. We've been largely working with ways that we can manipulate numbers and text and being able to get some coherency out of the data that's coming from a variety of systems. The challenge is that the economic models that we've built over time are losing coherency. Why? Because the systems are getting more complex. There's more capability. There's more things that we have to be able to distinguish and understand. And at the same time, we're leaving out an enormous amount of data. If we look at what's missing in this set of current world of analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, it's this idea that physical models, things that describe structure, things that have geospatial context, they're actually missing from the conversation because most of the time this data is you know, quite analog. And so this is an area that I'm starting to really put a lot of my own personal time and attention to. More recently, I started to work at Alteryx, uh, where I was very focused previous to coming to Caspery on a lot of the data science, data analytics challenges, where there was mostly a series of numbers and text to be able to distinguish. But at Caspery, what's really interesting for us is that we're focused on the convergence of these physical assets with digital context. What we're seeing is almost a fourth industrial age that's emerging where we can now capture all kinds of physical information using sensor-based input and be able to make very important decisions across the industries that we're focused in. One good example of this is mining and aggregates. This is what a typical quarry looks like um, on a mine site or a quarry site. The challenge with most of these places is that the way you take measurements of material on a quarry is that you actually climb that stockpile, use a GPS backpack or precision laser guided equipment, manually collect that data, and occasionally you'll fall off the stockpile, you'll, you'll sprain a leg, you'll, you'll break an arm, and it's ultimately very dangerous work. So we started to think at Caspery about ways that we can change that, that perspective. How can we deliver information in a safer, faster manner than manually climbing stockpiles of material? So let me show a quick demo, which is why I had to go back and make sure I got this dongle, otherwise this demo was not gonna go anywhere. Let me show a quick demo of, we can flip over to the other screen, thanks. Let's see if that might just fix the color. Great. Of how we do volumetric measurement of stockpiles and materials today. So what you're looking at here is a particular work site. In this case, I believe this is the Jim Bridger coal plant. And this is in Western Wyoming. Yep, okay, Central Wyoming, that was close. And we're looking at one of the largest producers of coal-based electricity in the country. And in this case, what we wanted to figure out was how much material of coal we have on this work site itself. So this is probably one of the largest stockpiles of coals that any of us has seen in our lives. What we're able to do with, with a product like Caspery is we're now taking a drone, flying overhead of this particular area. We're taking imagery, and instead of just taking a flat set of images, we're taking a series of high-resolution images and converting those images from 2D to 3D, largely using a technique called photogrammetry. The idea there is that you can see, take a series of angled images and start to stitch up 2D to 3D spaces. In this particular case, the accuracy of what you're stitching up is then hyper-coordinated with precision GPS so that the coordinate systems that we're ending up using is down to three centimeters of real space, X, Y, and Z. So when you actually now look at this particular volumetric of stockpile, well, let's do a few things to it. One is, Let's look at the contours. Let's look at 
what the accuracy of the elevations are within that specific space that we might be trying to further understand. If I wanted to, as I mentioned, look at this particular pile of material, not only in 2D, but now let's look at it in 3D as now we're stitching the photogrammetry pipeline together to build a three-dimensional model. If I wanted to understand what that material of stockpile was and I remove the ground and just look at the pile just to make sure that I've captured the area that I'm bounding with this polygon properly, I can certainly do that. If I wanted to remove the pile and see just the ground itself to understand if I captured the flat earth, I'm actually doing that correctly. So in this case, I'm not going to build out the specific measurement, but what you're looking at here is the pre-built measurement of this polygon that I just showed you in, in three dimensions um, a few moments ago. The calculation that you're seeing here is us going ahead and laying down five or six base points and then being able to calculate the volumetric of what's above the Earth cutting a base plane and then effectively what's below the Earth. If you multiply that specific volumetric against the density of the material, in this case we happen to know that this coal is 0.75 kilograms per cubic meter, we're able to now have a cut mass, which is everything that's above the Earth, of 484,140 kilograms. That specific measurement is hyper accurate within 1% of forecasted material there. In the mining aggregates world, most of the materials that were measured for years, as much as 10 or 15 years, had as much as a 10 to 15% forecasting variance. This was an incomplete game changer to be able to bring that physical data together with the analytic context that we're describing here. It actually changes the way that industrial work is done because now not only do you have a safer way without you know, spending weeks upon weeks climbing these stockpiles, spraining legs, breaking arms to be able to collect the data, but the accuracy, the consistency, the ability to now build a new inventory management system is very much possible with the marriage of physical context to geospatial and specifically the analytics that we're driving. Let's go back to the uh, slides. If we see how this is playing out in not only the industrial context, but also just some of the use cases that are now emerging for companies like ourselves, we see this as an extension of a series of machine learning and artificial intelligence capabilities start to extend the way that work is being done. What you're looking at here is a roof. And in this case, a lot of rooftops have to get measured and understood in terms of what damage looks like, particularly in the Midwest. Why? Because hail is actually a big issue in the Midwest. Hail is such a big issue that there's $6.2 billion of claims that are processed every year just for hail damage alone. And that's not including all the other weather damage that occurs, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment. The current process to be able to understand what hail damage looks like on a roof is you take a person, put a ladder to the side of the roof, you climb the roof, you have that person measure a 10 by 10 or a 5 by 20 measurement of the roof, basically a 100 square foot area of the roof, and then you manually count the number of hail strikes that are on that roof. So what's wrong with that problem? What's that? It's, it, so the, the, there's, there's a lot of uh, opportunity for skew, right, in, in terms of uh, the consistency of what's, re, what's being reported. What's the problem with climbing the roof itself? Dangerous. It is dangerous. It's actually the third most occupationally da dangerous job in the country today. So it's dangerous. The consistency and reliability of what's being done is actually not that great. And you can actually um, run into scenarios where what one measurement provides might not be aligned with what another measurement provides, um, specifically when there's no consistency in, in, in being able to do this. So let's actually flip back to the demos again, and let's show you how we started to rethink this. So this was our first cut of dimensional analysis on a rooftop where we flew the drone overhead, 
we created a 3D model, same idea as what you saw before. If you wanted to get the height and the dimensionality of any specific area, we automated the capability to now calculate the surface area, the perimeter, the pitch of the roof. But what we started to do then is, because of the resolution of what we can now achieve, all these little divots that you're seeing here is damage on a roof. And we've now started to use so those same deep learning algorithms to now distinguish what damage on a roof looks like. In this particular case, this is a valid claim for hail, mainly because you see the weather pattern going from south to north, where this particular aspect of the roof doesn't need to be replaced, this particular aspect of the roof doesn't need to be replaced, but most of this area does. If I was climbing the same roof and it took a measurement of a 10 by 10 here, or if I took a 10 by 10 here, I would have completely either overestimated or underestimated what it took to replace, in this case, a portion of the roof. If we look at this example, one of the things that we've heard back from a lot of our customers is that, you know what, this, this sort of machine automated way isn't good enough. You need to still be able to instill the knowledge and awareness of what a roofer, a claims adjudicator, an adjuster has in terms of their understanding of what a roof model looks like. And so what we started to do is build the next generation of our analytics largely using a human assistive form of what's basically known as a virtual test square. So in this particular example, what you can see is that we're now able to take the dimensional analysis of, let me see if I can get this connection back up and running. I may have lost it there. We're able to take this um, dimensional analysis of that particular surface of the roof and with the use of a 50 millimeter lens that we happen to be flying with, you can get down to literally granular level of, of detail of what that roof looks like and more importantly, start to annotate the roof and use the human awareness of what is hail and what isn't hail and bring that back into the deep learning model that I showed you a moment ago. So now you're starting to see this evolution of is it man or is it machine? Well, in this particular case, it's the combination of the two that starts to drive a better outcome. All right, let's go back here. Let's flip it back to the, to the slides. I think there is a world that's emerging here where we can start to define what I almost think of as digital twins, of these sort of really hard physical assets, be able to predict the asset maintenance value of a solar array, being able to understand when wind farms are running too hot, being able to know when you have the right amount of volumetric material of stockpiles. All of this happens in the context of geospatial data, analytics, and having those physical models be organized in one coherent way. If we look at a lot of where our focus and attention is, it's not only been, of course, like manufacturing a drone, which has been hard work in itself, but it's also being able to take the data that's coming off the drone, automate the processing in a way that the photogrammetry pipelines, the ML pipelines, the analytical pipelines are actually converged the geospatial context is all being converged into one seamless set of applications. So we do see a great future where these interactions between man and machine are continuing to create better outcomes for humanity. If you look at some of the work that we're now extending uh, into right now is, um, is being able to add additional sensors to this context. So we started with the ability to fly a drone that has a highly accurate visual sensor, 20 megapixel sensor, that has the ability to collect high resolution imagery. We added precision GPS, an accelerometer, a gyrotometer, LIDAR for collision avoidance. And the next realm of capability that we need to get into is being able to understand other spectral sources, other informational input that might be thermal in nature, that might be multispectral in nature. So what we're starting to now work on is capability to be able to, to understand where the thermal aspect of 
the capabilities that we're now delivering into market can be folded in. What you're looking at here is an industrial inspection where we now know the thermal overlay of data coming right alongside of all the other data that I just showed you a moment ago. So how does that appear in an application? Let's go back to my last demo, or next to last demo. So what you're looking at here is a specific high school that we flew over in Nevada. And in this particular example, we'll, we'll, we'll do the, the same thing. This is, uh, this is the, the elevation model that you're looking at here. And let's go ahead and switch over from the elevation model to the visual view. Visual view, we can of course kind of keep going in and if I wanted to understand if there were any specific issues visually on any portion of the roof, I can certainly do that. But now let's actually open up a thermal overlay. And so this was actually some clever work that we had a chance to accomplish from an engineering standpoint at Caspery. So what we're actually doing is we're taking the point cloud of the visual context that we're building around the, the photogrammetry pipeline and using the entropy edges of a thermal sensor and matching those two together by creating this overlay that you're seeing here. So now you can see a thermal overlay where I can even see when cars have left the parking lot or come into the parking lot. And more importantly for this specific use case, a visual inspection would not have elucidated some of the thermal issues that you're seeing here. And in particular, what you're seeing here is there's likely some water leakage that's occurring because there's water damage at the end of this particular roof. And the thermal, the, the thermal bloom that you're seeing is giving an indicator of where that water has been pooling and where there might be additional visual inspection uh, that's necessary. So we're starting to see more and more of these capabilities, go ahead and flip back to the, uh, to the slides. We're starting to see more and more of these capabilities where you can start to bring in all of these contexts to be able to understand what the physical nature of assets are and being able to improve them over time. One thing I did want to call out in my talk though is that we're at a moment in time where there's a serious moral obligation to the things that we're, we're taking on. If we think about the dislocation that's occurred for the past 30 plus years, it's pretty incredible to see this, right? Back in, let's see, when did this, this particular chart start? Back in 1980, if you think about where growth has occurred from an income basis, it's been mostly in kind of the, the lower end middle class where growth occurred. And if you think about the top 5% of, of the social stratosphere, it's actually where growth was close to zero. But you fast forward to where we are today and all of the wealth accumulation that's occurring in today's world is in this sort of top 99 plus percent. And in fact, you're seeing that same percent that was effectively in the lower middle class starting to see their specific incomes um, fall. Some of this, or a lot of this, is actually due to some of the things that we're all involved with in this room. We think about this bend in the curve, specifically in the 1975 to 1980 timeframe. We've historically had this progression of both wages and productivity continuing to rise alongside of just as we've become more productive as a society, everyone in society has been paid more. But this bend in the curve occurred in, in 1980 mainly because the kind of technology that we're all working on has created this dislocation, right? We as a society have become more productive than we've ever been before, but wages have become stagnant, mainly because technology has driven the cost of labor down while the productivity of corporations that we all work in, like ourselves, have actually continued to rise. So, I look at this as an opportunity in a lot of ways to rethink what the future of meaningful, dignified work is. I look at this as an opportunity to say that can we look at ways that, in, in, at least in my world, 
industrial work can be reimagined, where the right skills can be introduced for humans to complement the machines, the artificial intelligence, the technology that's actually driving these massive dislocations in society. Because if we think about it, these disruptions are only accelerating. And if you look at um, this particular view that I brought up here, the, the paid work that's occurring that's less likely to be displaced are things like dentists, financial managers, um, chief executives. OK, good. I get to keep my job for a little bit longer. But at the same time, the work that's being displaced is physical labor. It's also things that are repeatable, like audits, like credit analysis, loan officers. And so we're seeing not only this, this disruption and dislocation occur in what we would historically consider blue collar labor, but also just repeatable work among white collar labor. In my view, it is our greatest calling of this generation to not be working on the next series of social applications that are the, the better version of Snapchat, the better version of Instagram. In my view, we as technologists, we are people that are working on some of the hardest problems that are possible in this world, should be applying our time and our energy to be able to solve those in a meaningful way. This past year, we had an opportunity, and it turned out to be the case, that we trained a number of folks at Farmers which is uh, one of the larger insurance companies in North America, to start to use our drones to be able to do catastrophic response. The training time that we had picked in Kansas City, it turned out, was two weeks before Harvey. And we didn't know that. We just were actually working with farmers in this case just to get the catastrophic response teams up. So first and foremost, I don't know if anyone's been following this, this, this last hurricane cycle this past year. It was an absolute devastating experience. I was actually down in Houston just right after Harvey. The, the, the images don't even belie the level of damage that occurred, not only at Harvey I, and, and subsequently Irma, and then of course many of you heard about what happened with Puerto Rico with Maria. The recovery work that's involved here in these superstorms will actually last for quite a few years. We actually had an opportunity to be some of the first on the ground to be able to look at not only the catastrophic damage that occurred because of floods, but also just in the underlying areas, we were able to go into Corpus Christi and be able to help adjudicate claims, in this case, for all the wind damage that occurred. And so if you look at some of the things that we've done in this claims management use case, we were able to now take all of the wind damage that's occurred and create analytical models to be able to understand, well, to what extent did that wind damage occur? How many shingles were actually missing from the specific damage? Can you create an ML algorithm to be able to count all the shingles that were missing and be able to create a determination of that, whether that is a partial replacement or a full replacement? Let me just show one quick demo here as well. We're also able to uh, go ahead and flip over to the demo one last time, please. We're also able to look at entire blocks of impact. So this happens to be in, I believe this was Corpus Christi. Let me just verify. I always like to check where I'm demoing before I, yeah. So that is Corpus Christi. So in this particular neighborhood in Corpus Christi, what you're looking at here is the analytical model that was built to dimensionalize all the elements of the roof. We also were able to understand the impact of damage on the roof. And in this case, as opposed to the typical types of use cases where we fly over a single roof and take the, the uh, analysis, in this case, we started to fly over a specific neighborhood because we had the, the restrictions lim lifted from FEMA. So that enabled us to do some of this early interaction in terms of what the level and extent of, of wind damage looks like. These analytical models actually proved to be quite effective for the entire claims adjudication process. Go ahead and flip back to the, uh, to, to the, uh, the presentation. These processes that we had actually been able to build with drones, with AI, enabled a single claim adjuster, in this case, to be able to cover two to three homes per hour. The typical claims adjuster today covers two to three homes per day. 
it was a 10x productivity gain. And you know what? It's not that a single claims adjuster lost his or her job during that experience. It's the fact that we could actually go and cover every single home that needed to be covered in that period of time. And so I look at this as an opportunity where we can start to be able to bring these bridges together between man and machine to get a greater future built for us together. If anyone's read the seminal paper by J.C.R. Licklider in 1960, so this guy wrote this over 50 years ago, he talks about the man-machine symbiosis. And in it, he talks about the future work being not about machines replacing us. He talks about the fact that machines are augmenting the human potential. And I believe that we can be focused here to build this great future, whether it be for industrial work that I'm up to, or it be for broader use cases that everyone in this room is working, particularly in the geospatial context, to be able to complement machines assisting humans, to be able to support all the workloads that we're doing with machine learning and artificial intelligence, and to effectively converge these digital and physical assets together. So appreciate the time, appreciate the opportunity. Feel free to throw out some questions if you have any uh, from this dialogue. Thank you, everyone.